Um, we're, we're really coming to the end of this study in Ephesians, and everybody said? Amen. You guys are so unspiritual. <laughs> Paul is bringing this letter to a close. Um, he's talked about a lot of stuff. Uh, he's talked about the greatness of the purposes of God in their lives and ours. Um, he's talked about the battle that they have with their flesh, with the world, uh, the life that should follow as we make a commitment to Jesus. He's talked about the standards for them personally, the standards they were to have in their homes, in their marriages, with their employers, their employees, in their community. And as he moves on from those instructions for how to conduct themselves in kind of those major relationships to what is his closing document do, topic, the, the transition is almost abrupt. Um, where Paul begins to talk about this battle they were in with their enemy or their adversary, the devil. And the language that he uses in this next set of verses is really almost intense. And it would be great if all of us could spend our lives in some kind of undisturbed tranquility, but we're in a conflict with God's enemy. It's not just our enemy, but we're in a conflict with God's enemy. And because we belong to God now, we are his enemy. Satan, the devil, uh, he hates God. He has an incredible power. He wants to do everything he can to stop the kingdom of God. And the minute that you say, he is my Lord and Savior, you now have a target on your back. Uh, we're going to talk next week about the wiles of the enemy, the, the schemes of the enemy. He is so powerful. So He's not all, all, all powerful. He's not omniscient. He doesn't know all things. But he was the morning star. He was the most powerful angel in heaven. I mean, he has power. And his goal is to wipe us out, to cancel the things of God in our lives so that we no longer do what God has designed us to do. And so Paul is closing this letter to this church that he loves so deeply. And you would think he would end it, you know, maybe on a go team go kind of thing and on a, on a high note, but he gets kind of down into the trenches and he begins to talk about the importance of them understanding their adversary, understanding the devil and what's at stake. And so that's kind of how he wraps this up. One commentator said, these instructions are a call to battle. Like we are being roused, set up on our feet, told to be strong, diligent, prepared. The tone is almost martial or warlike, and it suggests that, as he says, there will be no cessation or no stop of hostilities until the end of life or history. I would add that apart from the words of Jesus, these may be my favorite verses in the New Testament that we're going to read right now. Let's stand as we read Ephesians 6. Verses 10 through 20. Would you read it with me? I may stop and make some comments along the way, as is my habit, but let's start. Ready? Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Whose might? His. Yeah, yeah, His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against, count them with me, ready? Against the rulers against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Do, do, go back to that. Like, do, do you believe that? I mean, that's a powerful statement right there. Sometimes, sometimes people say, well, the devil was in that, and, and a skeptic will say, don't blame that on the devil, but the devil is in so much. Well, next week, we're going to talk about just all the different ways he comes at us. All the arrows, the good, the bad, the ups, the downs, the valleys, the mountaintops, the riches, the poor, abased and faithful. He comes at us any way that he can. Read it again. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all, everybody say all. All the flaming darts of the evil one. 
Take up the shield of faith, I'm tricking you, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplications for all the saints. And then Paul adds, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Think about those last two verses. This is the guy that wrote a third of the New Testament. And he's in prison for his faith. And he says, would you pray for me that I would have boldness to share this faith as I should? That's crazy. What a great example. Lord, we were not persecuted for our faith yet. But we do pray for boldness this morning. Lord, you've, you've not given us a spirit of timidity or fear, but of power, soundness of mind. Lord, you are our strength. You are our might. We pray the same thing as Paul prayed. Oh God, that you would wash over us as weak as we feel at times, as frail as we are. God, as oft as we fail, that you would wash over us with your might that we might become what you have designated, designed us to be in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. This morning, I want to focus on the 10th verse, 13 words. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. The Amplified Bible says, draw your strength from him and be empowered through your union with him. It's all about him and in the power of his boundless, endless, ceaseless might. I'm going to look at a couple of statements as we begin. First, Paul says, finally. Some of you are thinking, are you really going to preach a whole sermon on one word, finally? I might do that. You never know. But the word doesn't mean like this is the last thing. I'm wrapping up my story, my letter. Uh, it means that to us sometimes. But in the Greek, the word is about how we choose to move forward. That's what it intimates. It's like you can tell somebody to hurry. You can tell them to be careful. It's a, it's a directional thing. This is how you're going to move. The root word that's used that Paul uses, he chose, the root word means to leave behind as you move ahead. So it's not this is the end of something. It's really this is the beginning of something. We're going a new direction. We're in this battle with our adversary, the enemy, and we need to like draw a line in the sand, get our coordinates, get our trajectory, and move forward in a certain direction. Finally, like put the word in the Greek means put everything else behind you. It was a word that soldiers would, in Paul's day, would commonly say to each other. I can't pronounce it in the Greek, but when they heard it, they knew exactly what that fellow soldier was saying. Like, look. Put it all behind you. We're going into battle. We're going to face some things that are bigger than us. We've got to have a singularity of focus. We can't dilly-dally around. We can't carry anything with us into battle or else we're going to get killed. And that's how any soldier would approach a battle, right? And that's the word that Paul chose here. Not that this is the end of the letter, but we are engaging an enemy. And we need to put everything behind us if we're going to win this thing. We need to have a a finely state of mind. Too often the battles that we lose, we lose them because we don't have a finely state of mind, if you know what I mean. Like we don't, we don't put everything else behind us. We're trying to juggle all these things and fight a battle with an adversary who hates us and is God's enemy as well. We're trying to fight that battle at the same time. It's no wonder we get our you-know-whats whipped, right? Let's... Let's have a finely state of mind, church. Whatever it is that keeps hamstringing us, let's get that off the plate and win some wars, amen? That's what Paul is saying, finally. Next he says, 
We are to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. It's the same thing that God told the Israelites before they engaged in all those battles that they had with their enemies. And remember that when Israel went in to to, uh, take over the promised land, they were outnumbered most of the time. Jericho was a fortified city. It was the greatest city in all of the region. They were way outnumbered when they walked into Jericho. And yet, at the Lord's direction, as they did exactly what he told them to do, the walls fell down and they, they went into Jericho and it became theirs. But you know what happened after Jericho, then came Ai, and then after that, the Bible says that there were like five or six or seven different kings that got together, and they said they they formed an an alliance to go against Israel. I mean, they were outnumbered every turn that they made. Think about that. You, You win a battle, you just conquer this land, and it's like the first or second battle in, and the next thing you know, seven kings get together and they come against you. Then what are you going to do? You're going to be strong in yourself, right? No, you're going to be strong in who? Yeah, God told that to Joshua over and over and over again. Be strong and be not afraid, not in your might, but in the power of his might. Let's remember who wrote these things, right? These, are these not the words of God? Is not the Bible the inspired words of God? Are they man's words? Are they man's words? No. They're the holy inspired words of God to us. Either all of them are or none of them are. Either all of it's true or none of it's true. And God is the one that wrote these things. He's the one who is holding himself up as the person who we can trust. The person who we can turn to. He says, be strong in the strength of my might. Hebrews says that God is not a man that he should lie. He can't lie. If he makes a promise and says, be strong in the strength of my might, I think he believes that. We have this promise from God that we can be strong in the power of the almighty might of God Almighty, right? If that's redundant enough for you. That's the kind of might that we have. There's a difference between might and almighty, isn't there? Man can be mighty. There's men, men do things that sometimes just blow you away. Like, I can't believe that guy did that. I can't believe they built that. I can't believe he built that company. I, I mean, they're just things that people do that just blow you away. I can't believe they're that smart. They're just mighty. But God is almighty. It's in his name. And it's, it's, it's in his nature. It's in his attributes. And not only that, but he holds himself up and he says, you can have the same almighty might in you. I will give you that kind of strength. That's what Paul is suggesting here. But we don't believe that, do we? I mean, we believe that it's true. We believe that it's possible, but we haven't experienced that for ourselves. You know, we, we strengthen ourselves according to our own might a lot of times, our own capacity or the way that we're wired, the things that we have within ourselves, our diligence, our strength, our discipline. We strengthen ourselves within our own human strength all of the time. And that's not a bad thing. But to experience the might of God Almighty, I don't think we really know what that's like to walk in. I don't know that I do. Once in a while, just this, like you just know that's the direction of the Lord and you just woof, off you go. But we don't experience it like the Bible suggests. So how are we strengthened in the Lord? How How do we get past those things that keep hamstringing us? How do we get past those those addictions how do we get past that offense how do we get past the anger how do we get past the 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 fruit of the flesh how do we get past that so that we're strengthened in the lord that's what paul is talking about here he says be strengthened in the lord and in his might how do we do that that's what i want to know is that what you want to know that's what we're going to talk about today so i'm going to just share five things with you of how we're strengthened in the might or the strength of the lord First of all, we're strengthened in the Lord when we spend time with the Lord. That's kind of obvious, isn't it? I added that at last minute. I, I was laying in bed last night, which isn't unusual, going over my message in my head, and I thought, how can you teach on being strengthened in the Lord and not, talking about, and not talk about spending time with the Lord? That doesn't, that's almost heresy. 
it's something that, that has just become part of my normal habit. Just spending time with the Lord is how I'm strengthened in the Lord. Spending time in what we call prayer. I really want to change the name of prayer. I don't know what we're going to call it. We'll call it something else. And the reason I want to call it something else is we have this idea of what praying is. You know, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray thee, Lord, my head to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray thee, Lord, my soul. You know, that, like we're, we're talking to the Lord. Nothing against Catholicism. They have some beautiful memorized prayers, but prayer becomes just this rote you know, and people will say, I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to talk. And we've turned prayer into something that I don't think God ever intended. Prayer is, is really just part of being with God. Last Sunday was Father's Day. But the, the highlight of my day was just being with my kids. I love that. You, you moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, you love that. Kids, you, you don't think... You, that you mean that much to your parents sometimes. I, I don't know where you get that idea, but we all thought that. But man, they just love being around you. You think, oh, they don't act like they love being around me. They do. They, they love, well, when you get older, they'll love being around you. Maybe they don't love being around you. But I just love being around my kids, right? We, they talked. We played pickleball. We ate. We we listened, we interacted, we just, we just had a day of it. It was a swell day. It was a great day. That's, that's what it means to hang out with the Lord. It, it's not just this memorized prayer. It's not that you have to pray like Kirk or you have to pray like one of the other staff guys or one of the elders and you think, I can't pray like that. I can't leak my syllables together like that. I get all tongue-tied. I don't know, know what to say. I mean, that's crazy to even think that. Just be with the Lord. He wants to be with you. That's it. Hang out. Listen. Wait. Sing. Play music. Be vulnerable. Pour your heart out. And if your kids come to you, and it's a rare thing, but if they just begin to pour their heart out, you're like, there's something in your nature that's like, oh, I, she's serious. There's something going on in her life. I... I want to hear that. I mean, there's casual conversation, and there, but there's times when your children come to you and, and you just know that this is important and you're, you're all ears. You are God's kids. And part of praying and seeking His face is just being with Him. Another part is reading the Bible. Reading the Bible. The word, the holy inspired words of God. But we've turned it into boxes that you check. And we've turned it into religion. We've turned it into rote. I got to read these five chapters. If I don't read these five chapters, I'm going to be a day behind. We, you know, I, I want to get through this thing in a year. I want to get through it in two years, whatever it is for you. It just becomes diligence and discipline. And, and we should never allow our diligence and our discipline to, to uh, cause us to not just meditate on the word of the Lord. He's not in a hurry for you to get through the Bible, okay? That ought to, you ought to be shouting if you read like me. He's not in a hurry. He just wants you to be in the Word. Just meditate on it. It could be a verse. It could, it could be a chapter. You might be a speed reader. You might read five or six chapters. I don't care. He just wants to be with you. That's how we strengthen ourselves in the Lord. Begin your day with the Lord. Right? Begin your day with the Lord. Some of you say, oh, I'm just not a morning person. I don't believe that. We train ourselves to do anything we want, right? You all potty trained in here? <laughs> Everything you do, somebody trained you. Your parents trained you, and then you, you trained yourself by watching what your parents did. If, if your dad came home from work and, you know, started working and mowing and weeding and building stuff, and you, you're going to be like your dad probably. You just, you just, if your dad came home from work, sat in a chair and read the paper, you probably do that. We just learn from those who we watch. 
and then we train ourselves. You watch America's Got Talent. I, I mean, what dogs and other things do, the talents that those animals have, that's nothing compared to what we humans have trained ourselves to do. I know a guy, personally, who taught himself to bounce a basketball on his head at the free throw line, just got higher and higher and higher, and then he'd get it high enough to where he could make a shot from the free throw line by bouncing that ball on his head, and it never hit the ground. I watched him do it at Springfield High School. Why would anybody train themselves to do that? <laughs> if you knew the guy, you'd probably not wonder anymore. <laughs> Yeah, he almost made it to the Tonight Show, but he went to New York and he failed, you know, so he didn't make the shot. But I mean, we just, we train ourselves to do all kinds of stuff. It's not that you're not a morning person. It's that you haven't trained yourself to do that. I'm just suggesting start your day with the Lord. If you want to be strengthened in the Lord, begin your day that way. It's not hard. You think, oh, I just can't get up an hour earlier. Yes, you can. If you go to bed at 1 in the morning and you drag yourself out of bed at 5 in the morning, this next five or six days, I'm going to guarantee you, you're going to start going to bed earlier. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so tired and it's 9 o'clock. Exactly, you're training yourself to do something different, right? I mean, this is like common sense stuff. There's a lot of people in this room who have went through seasons where you got up an hour earlier or two hours earlier and you just waited on the Lord and you prayed and you read your word and you started your day that way and then you just got busy and it fell away, it fell through the cracks. It, it, that's life. But if you were to look back on that season of your life, I would venture that most of you would say, that was a great season of my life. It was one of, the, one of the best seasons of my life was when I did that. It's not condemnation. It's just we got away from it. And so we can train ourselves to get back to it. It's not... Um, it's, it's exist. A couple of weeks ago, I think it was two weeks ago, man, I've been just burning up both ends. I was tired. And I called the guys. I said, hey, I'm not going to make it to the church at 6 in the morning. I just, I just, I'm not going to make it. You know, God, God's honored by that as much as he is me dragging myself down here at 6. If my heart's not in the right place. But it is important if we want to be strengthened in the Lord that we begin our day with him. You receive that? I encourage you to do that. Begin your day with the Lord. I'm almost out of time. I got four more points. <laughs> Let me just go through these. We're strengthened in the Lord when we initiate a relentless, unstoppable war against sin in our My battery just is dying. Let me switch, Todd. I'll go to the... When we initiate a relentless, unstoppable war against sin in our lives, that's how we're strengthened. Nothing will rob us of the power of the Almighty quicker than the sins that we give safe harbor to. It's like COVID on steroids. We all have those sins that we hide. It's the ones that we think that we can manage, we can train, we can tame. I can lay that on the altar anytime I want. It's not controlling me. I'm controlling it. We all have those sins. But we have to mount an offensive war against those things because they will rob us of the strength of God. They don't lay down on any altar. It's not Isaac on the altar. The picture in the Old Testament is a seven-day-old calf, and it's for good reason. You take a calf that's one day old, you can throw that thing on the altar and sacrifice it. It's no big deal. You try to take a seven-day-old calf down, you got a fight on your hands. And I don't know about you, but there's some things inside of my carnal flesh that have some fight in them. 
and I have to mount a war against those. And then I'm strengthened in the Lord. The devil is, he gets us to believe that we can lay them down at any time and all the time he's stabbing us in the back with those things. Thirdly, we're strengthened in the Almighty when we reject the ways of the world. There's that the sins that we fight, that we do battle against, but there's also the world that's in an adversary towards us. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This being renewed and transformed cannot happen without rejecting our old ways the life that we came out of. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We destroy every argument and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. There's this battle that's in us. We have to seize those things. Joshua 23.6-8, Joshua is getting ready to die. Uh, in the next chapter, he, he dies at the age of 115. He's been with the Israelites for 115 years. And he's giving them his last instructions. They've already taken part of the promised land. And the thing that he emphasizes the most is don't mix with them. Don't do what they did. Don't worship the gods that they worship. Don't have anything to do with the world that you are now moving into. Instead, he says, cling to the Lord. We live in the world, but we're not of the world. We have to be separate from those things. And I'm telling you, I don't think we fail because we mix with things that we're unaware of. Like, I didn't know that would lead me there. I'm not, there's times that the enemy sets a snare for us. We get caught in a trap. Yes, that's true. But more often than not, there's those warning signs that are going off. It's like a gray area. And we, there's something inside of us that says, I just don't feel like that's right. I don't feel like that would honor God. I don't feel like God would want me to do this, to go there, to be with him, to be with her, to say this, to say that. You know, there's, there's those warning signs. And we walk right into the gray area. Like we, we have to reject the ways of the world. They, they if you think about them or you ponder them for even a moment, suddenly they'll begin to look okay or right. Well, the world does that. It's not a big, big deal to take an extra one. It's not a big deal to cheat on this, lie on that, steal a little tiny of this, to have that attitude. That's, a, <coughs> that's the world influencing us. And so if we're going to be strengthened in the Lord, we have to reject those things. Fourth, if we're going to be strengthened in the Lord, we have to persevere to the end. We have to finish the race. We have to be soldiers. It's a lifelong battle. One commentator said, our work and our life must go off together. I like that. My faith in Jesus Christ, my commitment to following him must end when my last breath is taken. Sometimes we think, I want some leave. I want to I wanna go goof off. I want some free time. I don't, I don't want to be a soldier every day. I don't want to have to be that committed to this thing. But how many times has that bit, bit us in the butt over the years, right? You know, you let go of the oars. You just relax for a minute. Next thing you know, you're knee deep. And you know what? It's like we, this is, it takes diligence. It takes this effort to just keep at it. We have to persevere to the end because we have an adversary. And the last way we're strengthened in the Lord is by trusting him even when he seems a long ways away. When you can't see him, when you can't feel him, when, you, when, when worship is dry, when reading the word is dry, when your time in the morning is dry, you, you know, it's like all indicators is that he's afar off. Even then, when we trust him, we are strengthened. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 10 says, Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Listen to this. Let him who walks in darkness and has no light, 
Trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. I love that. Let, let those of us who walk in darkness and we have no light, we have no idea where God is, we have no idea what's going on in our lives, we're in the valley of the shadow of death, the sun isn't, hasn't shone for months, let them trust in the name of the Lord our God and rely on him. Man, it takes great faith to believe this stuff when you're in the grip of temptation. It takes great faith to believe this stuff when you're in the furnace of affliction. When the enemy comes with those damning lies and he tells you that you'll never make it, that you'll always be a failure, it takes great faith to hang on to this stuff. When you can't see God, when you're not experiencing him, when, it's, when you're surrounded by darkness, when you turn to him and you trust in him in that setting, something is released from heaven into your life. God loves you. He paid a high price for you. He paid the price of his son's own life. His thoughts for you never stop. They never cease. And when you trust in him, even when you can't see him, you're not experiencing anything, there's something about his purposes that just come flooding into your life. Don't give up. Persevere. Keep trusting even in the darkness. Deuteronomy 131, God told the Israelites that when they were in the wilderness, he carried them as a man carries his son. Think about that. Ever have a child that gets hurt and you just, just pick him up or a grandchild and you carry him? It's not just that you're carrying that little tyke. It's that you're protecting them, right? It's like nothing's going to hurt you now because I got you. In the darkest place that you've ever been in, even when you didn't know he was there, he was carrying you. In Exodus, God said, I bore you on the wings of an eagle. Now, the Israelites were actually walking. They weren't flying through the air when God did that, right? But from God's estimation, he was carrying them all along. And Isaiah said, even in your old age and your gray hairs, I am with you and I will watch over you and I will care for you. That kind of covers the basis, doesn't it? From beginning to end, from bottom to top. God's at the bottom of the ladder. He's at the top of the ladder. And he's at every rung in between, pushing us along the way, carrying us, even in your darkest moment. There are people that are here that would say, man, I've done all those things. I've waited on the Lord. I prayed. I spent time with the Lord. I've mounted an assault against sin. I persevered. I've, I've rejected the things of the world. I've trusted in him in, in the darkness, and nothing but bad has befallen me. Tried it all, and it doesn't work. There's lots of people that say that. People say that to me from time to time. Sometimes friends have said that to me. And maybe I've thought it as well. But I will usually share when somebody tells me that. I will remind them. I'll just, would, would you just go back for a ways? And recount when God has shown up. Do you remember where you were at 15, 18, 23, 45, 62, whatever it is for you? Right? Do you remember that event, that disease, that hardship? Do you remember that trial, that affliction? Do you remember that time when your parents were throwing plates at each other across the house. I, whatever, do you remember when God showed up and he was with you? He met you. He provided miraculously. We need to be reminded. We need to remind ourselves of the times that God has shown up. That's why the Bible is full of times where God recounts just how faithful he has been to his people. Because we have this habit of forgetting and we, when we forget, then we indict God like you never showed up. It's not true. I would encourage you to think back. Where would you be without God? Where would you be without God? I can't imagine where I would be without God. I would also tell you or just encourage you this morning that regardless of the circumstances that you are facing in the natural, um, if you persevere, the strength of Almighty will come. The Bible says in Isaiah 40, 31, They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as an eagle. They shall run 
and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah, or Psalm 126.5 says, Those who sow in tears shall reap with songs of joy. You want to be strengthened in the Lord? Start your day with Him. Mount an assault on the sins that you've been hiding. Reject the ways of the world. Just reject them. They're not working out anyway. Persevere and trust him when you can't see him. And he will strengthen you. Can I pray for you? Father, I thank you for this amazing congregation that I get to lead. Lord, your grace is amazing to me. Lord, we're all the same in, in many ways. Lord, we all wrestle with weaknesses, with doubts. Lord, we all wrestle with times of darkness. Lord, we need to be strengthened in you. That is a truth. Lord, the success of our Christian walk depends on how confident we are that we can have the strength of Almighty come and breathe into us. And so, God, here I am, here we are. We we just surrender our lives to you, and we ask that you would give us your strength for our weakness, that there would be that great exchange. God, there's this rich mine, this rich treasure that is before us called the strength of Almighty God. Lord, I pray that we would spend our days mining that strength, taking it in. Lord, we thank you for the strength you've given us. We thank you. Lord, that you've been so faithful and patient with us. Lord, we want to become all that you have for us. Would you go with us now in Jesus' name?